Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kostuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga wisdom and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Everybody. Live from morning, Super Farm. Morning, Mary. This is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show and welcome to Interview Day. Sunday is our, one of our favorite days, Interview Day. If you're listening for the first time on Facebook, welcome. We do this show. This is a study of the Srimad Bhagavatam, one of, most India, uh, one of India's most classic literatures on yoga connection real ancient wisdom made practical made relevant and so this is one of the things we like to do we're yoga fans but we want to get to the origins of it um, and how we can apply that you know people learn their yoga philosophy and their yoga teacher training well how do you apply it how do you use it how, how does it become real instead of just some theoretical thing that i read for a you know, in five hours of my teach 200 hour training. How do I make this come to life? This is what we plan on doing and this is what we're practically doing. We're joined with um, a, a big group of Zoom people every day and then, you know, 10,000 plus people on Apple Podcasts, etc. But on Saturday and Sunday, we bring it on Facebook to uh, lure you into our net. So today we have a very special guest, um, which uh, I'm, I'm excited to... Uh, to have, oh, I'm looking on all my questions. We have UFO. His name is Michael Cremo. Welcome, Michael Cremo, also known as Druda Karma Das. Welcome, honored to have you. He's in Los Angeles. I'm going to give you your bio first. It's not a bio, I just pulled it from Google. It's not his official bio. Michael Cremo, also known by his devotional name, Druda Karma Das, is an American freelance researcher who identifies himself as a Vedic creationist and an alternative archaeologist and argues that humans have lived on Earth for millions of years. So uh, I'm going to call you by your initiated name. He, you're initiated by Prabhupada. When did you get into a, a bhakti, Druta Karma Prabhu? Nope, we're not hearing him. Oop, we're not hearing him. Yeah. How did it go so bad? We had, in our <laughs> test, it was working so perfect a moment ago. No, nope, still can't hear. What did we do to that computer since then? He's not muted. Is your volume down? Or have government agencies interfered? <laughs> government agencies know about this. They're trying to shut it down. He's got too much valuable information. We still can't hear you, Prabhu. So you might want to adjust. Okay. Ah, right. oh, there we are. There we go. Oh, we got you. No, you just, just yeah, it didn't like this USB headset, so I'll just use the mic that's in the computer. Okay. It actually sounds okay. Maybe just sit a little closer. Okay. How are you? Uh, well, now that you can hear me, I'm fine. <laughs> it's 4:45 yeah. a.m. Yeah. in Los Angeles. We're four. Oh, five, four yeah, five. I joined the Hare Krishna movement in 1973. I. I I got a copy of Bhagavad Gita at a Grateful Dead concert in upstate New York. 
and uh, you know, I took it home. I read it. It made a lot of sense to me. So I started going to the an ISKCON preaching center in Albany, which was near where I was living. You know, at the at the time, I I was really interested in finding some spiritual path, and I consider myself fortunate. Became a disciple of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and really changed my whole life. Yeah, well, um, you're an author of a lot of books, actually. I didn't realize how many books you authored. Forbidden Archaeology is probably the biggest one. Hidden History of the Human Race, the condensed edition of... Oh, that's the... Oh, okay. That's the condensed... That's the condensed version, because Forbidden Archaeology is massive. And yeah, it's 900 is. pages. Sometimes people call it Forbidding Archaeology, because it's such a <laughs> big book, heavy to pick up. <laughs> And I love the title of this next one, Human De-Evolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory. Um, yeah. Um, I would love, uh, maybe we should, uh, I'll, I'm going to continue because there's more. The Forbidden Archaeologist, um, that must be somewhat, that's like, I guess it's like a spin-off. That's a collection of columns that I wrote for Atlantis Rising magazine. Oh. I kind of collected them all. The name of my column was the Forbidden Archaeologist. Oh, nice. You, you know, um, someone, someone in the background sounds like they have a clock that alarm that's going off or something. I'm not sure if it's you, Raghu, or our guest. I don't think it's me. Is there an alarm? Okay. okay. Or maybe me. someone's unmuted. I don't know. Mara, is that you? <laughs> okay. No, it's not me. <laughs> not me. That who's unmuted. Um. Forbidden archaeology. What what does modern science say? How old are humans? How old are we? They supposed to be? When did we start farming? This is a big thing too. Uh, when did we start uh, farming? Uh, gr uh, what's it called? Agrarian or agrarian culture? Agriculture. When did agrarian? Yeah. Agrarian culture. When did that uh, start? Well, modern science says human beings like us first came into existence less than 300,000 years ago. But, you know, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there are histories, Vedic histories of human populations on this planet going back to the very beginnings of the history of life on Earth. Uh, you know, like the Srimad Bhagavatam tells the story of Dhruva Maharaj who lived at the beginning of the Kalpa or the day of Brahma. Uh, you know, that's about 2 billion years ago. You know, if you calculate the yugas and everything like that. So it's, you know, I, I kind of wondered, well, is what the Srimad Bhagavatam is saying, is that to be taken as mythological or something? Or is there perhaps some evidence that supports it. So that got me looking into the whole history of archaeology. And I found that many archaeologists have reported finding human bones, human artifacts, human footprints, many, many millions of years old. So question is, why, why aren't these discoveries mentioned in today's textbooks? they're sort of forbidden in the mainstream circles. So that's why I called the book Forbidden Archaeology. Why, why, why would they be forbidden? Like, why, why won't they be like, wow, this, this disproves our theory. What, now we can come up with, isn't this great news? You know, uh, why would they say um, the, the world, uh, when we found out that the world was round, wasn't that great news? Didn't that change the way we were thinking? Why shouldn't this be like on the headlines? Yeah, it's, it's really pretty amazing. I, you know, I, I think it's because it so radically contradicts the present view of things that it, it means they would have to come up with a radically new theory to explain our origins, and it would have to involve consciousness. And ultimately, consciousness is something different than matter. Uh, and that, that causes huge problems for our modern civilization, which is based on people identifying themselves as purely material beings. 
uh, were, according to modern science, were machines made of molecules, and that's all there is to it. And as far as consciousness is concerned, well, that's just some temporary byproduct of bioelectrical energy in the brain. Yeah, yeah, so they have a whole civilization based on the idea that our main purpose in human life is just to be good consumers and producers of material things competing with each other. And, you know, it's like a whole system. So if people had a different idea, I'm a being of pure consciousness, you're a being of pure consciousness, we're all beings of pure consciousness, it'd be an entirely different kind of civilization. You know, based, you know, people would be putting energy into developing their consciousness. That'd be less energy going into material production and consumption. It's, you know, a lot of people, a lot of forces in society today wouldn't want to see such a change. So they want to keep the current materialistic theories of human origins intact. You know, um, you know, over the course of human history, things are shifting, ideas shift. Um, what, what is um, an entirely unacceptable idea at one point in history, and if you even bring it up, you're immediately labeled like kooky or, you know, whatever. Um, as time passes, that can become an accepted view, an accepted worldview. Um, currently, it seems that if someone does not accept the theory of evolution as being fact, that for many people right there, that's like conversation over. It's like, I, I can't even talk to you. You're not a, even a reasonable person. Like, you know, there's kind of like a, dismissive. You know, a, a very dismissive, yeah, kind of uh, border that's crossed there. Now, your book, Forbidden Archaeology, I read that when it came out. I'm, was that in that sometime in the 90s? That was, I believe, correct? Yeah, 1993 to be. 93. Exact. And when I read it, um, I mean, it was a bold. You know, it was a very bold kind of, um, in my opinion, you know, a very bold statement um, where you were saying that, hey, if it were a fact that there was no evidence for this, you know, that there was no evidence for, for human life existing far, you know, going far further back than modern science is currently saying, if there's no evidence for it, that would be one thing, but it seems like there's just as much evidence for it as as there is against it and and you it's a big thick book which is a you know a, largely it's a compilation of evidence is that correct i mean yeah. your theory is put forth but especially it's like a it's like a big compilation of archaeological digs and so on well it's things that have been they, they are discoveries that were made by scientists reported in the professional scientific literature, but have been eliminated from uh, the discourse and science mm. by what I call a process of knowledge filtration. But, you know, these different ideas have always been around. According to the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's always been materialists and atheists and people who practice yoga and people who are Vaishnava, Vedantist, and every, everything that they, they've all always existed. But at certain points in time, one of them is dominant. Mm -hmm. you know, so maybe 5,000 years ago, the Vedic culture was dominant in society. Um, and the materialists were more or less in the minority and you know, the alternative. Now it's the materialists who are dominant. And, you know, if you're a practitioner of bhakti yoga, of Vaishnava, you're kind of in the minority. And in terms of who's got power over the institutions and society. So can you give us some examples of the types of, I mean, it wasn't just like some no name, you know, uh, archaeologists, but that were finding these things. But could you give us some ex some like strong examples of evidence that was found um, to counter the current ideas? 
Yeah, I'll give you some of the older examples in terms of the history of archaeology, because what I did is I looked at the whole history of archaeology, not just what's in today's textbooks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like, say, going back to the 19th century, you look at the California gold mine discoveries. You know, gold was discovered in California. Miners went there to get the gold. They were digging tunnels into sides of mountains. They were finding human skeletal remains. They were finding obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles, all kinds of things. And they came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of California. So he began visiting the sites, collecting the artifacts, studying the geology of the place to determine how old they were. And he published a massive report posted by Harvard University in the year 1880. But you know, we don't hear about these discoveries today. They were made in layers of rock, 50 million years old. So from a modern geologist or scientist point of view, that's completely beyond imagination. For a Vedic archaeologist, it's not surprising at all because a Vedic archaeologist would expect to find evidence for a human presence going back hundreds of millions of years on this planet. So what happened is there was this other scientist, William Holmes, who was a, a follower of the theory of evolution. He worked at the Smithsonian Institution and he, he said, he, he reported- Is this in the same uh, era? Yes, yeah, it was a contemporary of Whitney, okay. but he was higher up in the scientific hierarchy. So he kind of just shut Whitney down. He said, he, you know, if this Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution, then he wouldn't have published those <laughs> reports. In other words, it must be wrong because it doesn't fit into our theory. That's absolutely right. And they're very open about it. You know, he stated directly, well, it, this it doesn't go along with the theory, so it's got to be wrong. Yeah. He should have known that. I, I think I can understand how humans uh, might have lived for millions of years. But the question is, what are all those beastly men in between? Like the, one, like the Neanderthals on the giant skulls. Who are they then? And what happened to them? Bigfoot, Yeti, these kind of things. Is yeah, are these, what are those? Then they, they became extinct. Well, it, it's interesting because the Srimad Bhagavatam, you know, the Bhagavad Purana and other Vedic literatures like the Ramayana, Mahabharata, they talk about beings they call Vanaras, mm -hmm. like Hanuman was in that category. And they had ape-like bodies, but human-like intelligence. And they, they, they had a simple level of culture, uh, like the descriptions of Ramachandra attacking the island of Lanka. Um, the Vanaras assisted, you know, with tree, throwing trees and boulders and things like mm -hmm. that, while Ram and his brother Lakshman playing human-like roles were using, you know, more advanced weapons. So I think these creatures that modern science considers to be intermediates are actually they're vanaras. And if you actually look at the whole pattern of archaeological evidence, you get the idea that millions of years ago, there were human beings like us coexisting with these eight man-like creatures, hmm. the vanaras, and there were apes and monkeys, regular apes and monkeys. <laughs> I think the same thing is still true today. There may be surviving members of this Vonera class. They're called Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the Yeti. And were they mystical beings or, or was it just Hanuman that was a mystical being? 
it seems that a lot of the Vanaras had mystic powers. And it appears that perhaps the creatures that are existing today, according to some researchers, also have those powers because haven't managed to really grab one. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, true. <laughs> you don't see one in the zoo. And... You know, so, so in other words, where scientists might find the, rem the, the, the remains of some kind of monkey, half man, half monkey, and, and kind of assign that as like, here's a middle stage of evolutionary progression. You're saying yeah. that, no, actually they existed as well as full on humanoids, as well as apes back coexisted. then, they coexisted. Yeah. And they currently coexist today too. And, and, and people actually do report seeing them, <laughs> you know, there's around the world, like all the time people reporting seeing them, but those are also kind of rejected. Absolutely, that, that's what the, if you actually look at all the evidence, that's what appears to be true. And it kind of goes along as consistent with what the Srimad Bhagavatam says. Mm -hmm. And of right. course, you could even go further because the Vedic literature says there are 400,000 human-like forms of life scattered throughout the universe. Right, so we right. Here, could expect a, to see different ones. Here's a question for you, Prabhu. What the hell is a dinosaur then? What is a dinosaur? <laughs> I think my guru, Srila Prabhupada, once said, dinosaur, finosaur, some big animal was existing. It's a big reptile. And even today, we coexist on this planet with big, dangerous reptiles. Sure, but Komodo dragons. Komodo dragons. I, I used to live in Florida, and you got to watch out because <laughs> alligators massive alligators yeah. and australia they've got these seagoing crocodiles that are massive 30 feet long mm. you know it's so there were, maybe there were some big bigger dangerous reptiles that existed in past times you know in the Srimad bhagavatam there's a story of how lord krishna's and his sons went out of the city of Dwarka to go in the forest and they saw a big hole in the ground. And in, in this hole in the ground was a massive lizard-like creature. And the Sanskrit in the Srimad Bhagavatam says it was as big as a mountain. So what's a lizard as big as a mountain? Kind of like, sounds like well, a dinosaur. There's a dinosaur down there. <laughs> So sometimes people ask me, are dinosaurs mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam? I said, at least one is. Right. Okay. Now, now, um, when I read that book, and, and I don't have any scientific background, but I was impressed by the thoroughness of your research. Um, and that was, you know, a few decades ago. Um, I know that you wrote a book about the reception of that. You wrote a book about how that book was received by the scientific community. But my question to you is today, nearly 30 years later or so, not only based on your own work, but I, I'd imagine there are other, you know, um, Christian scientists and other scientists that um, put forward arguments against the theory of evolution today. Is, has there been any crack in that theory? Has there been any momentum, broader momentum, uh, that's willing to open up to other ideas in the, in the broader scientific community? Uh, yes, there are many mainstream scientists who are um, <clears throat> exploring alternatives to the Darwinian theory, which is based on natural selection. Hmm. And Darwin didn't know anything about DNA or genes. So uh, in the early part of the 20th century, modern scientists introduced genetics into the Darwinian theory of evolution. And that was called the Neo-Darwinian synthesis. 
And that was based on the idea that DNA contains on, on its own the whole plan for an organism, its form, its shape, its different organs and everything. And many scientists today, many mainstream scientists don't accept that idea. They think there are factors other than the genes and the DNA that determine the form of, of uh, an organism. So there, e even within the world of science, they're kind of stepping away, many of them from the strictly Darwinian, Darwinian neo-Darwinian synthesis. Uh, and has, I'm sorry, please continue. And, and okay, I'll just briefly say that there are many scientists today who are willing to explore alternatives. And I think that's one reason I've been able to make so many presentations at mainstream mm -hmm. scientific conferences there are some scientists who are willing to listen to alternatives. And, and that's a good thing because if ideas are gonna change, first step is you have to be able to listen to alternatives, right. not try to shut them down or marginalize hmm. them. Has, has there been any recognition, wider recognition of what you label the, the knowledge filter, how that play, has played out over the course of scientific history? Well, the knowledge filter idea is in one sense, not original with me. It's something that historians of science and philosophers of science have understood for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in modern times, there was Thomas Kuhn who wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He introduced the idea of what he called paradigms. Uh, and it's kind of infiltrated into popular culture. You say, oh, your paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if something doesn't paradigm paradigm shift. Into, yeah. yeah if, you're, if something, and the significance of that is if something doesn't fit a paradigm, it tends to be set aside, forgotten, ignored, sometimes actively suppressed. So Kuhn had this idea that what happens over time is that paradigm shift and something that was an anomaly before uh, provokes a new scientific concept. And he, that happens very rarely. So, so this idea of knowledge filtering is very much like the idea of a paradigm governing what scientists think is acceptable or not acceptable. So it's not a new idea. But in terms of its relation to the theory of evolution, has it been more broadly accepted that this was at play? Uh, yes. It, of course, it depends. You know, these groups are not monolithic. You sure. get some people who are very committed to a Darwinist, mechanistic, reductionistic, materialistic, point of view, that's one group in the world of science. It's very, very loud and vocal and vociferous. But there are other scientists that may at this present moment be committed to the mainstream views, but they are willing to listen to alternatives. Okay. So that has to be kept in mind. And among that group who are willing to listen to alternatives, some actually accept alternatives, hmm. like mine, for example. They're few in number, but that's the way things go. Sure. Um, can I go ask you a question about, it's a very popular thing right now, and I'm sh you might even know about it um, because you dip your toes into this field a lot. Everyone's talking about the theory that the earth is flat. Now, I know we say that Sometimes when you look down on the universe from like a demigod position, the islands, the earth, the, the globes even can appear like islands. So in that sense, they would be flat or the we call the Bu Mandala for like, I don't know if that's the plane plane of the earth 
or the Earth planets, and that maybe is considered flat. What do you say if someone says, hey, I believe in this new theory that the Earth is flat, everything, the whole Earth is round thing is a conspiracy, and here's why. Uh, have you heard that theory being uh, proposed? Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard the theory, and if that's what makes sense to some people, that they've got a right to think that way. Um, for me, as a practitioner of bhakti yoga, the issue always goes back to what do the Vedic literatures say? Sure. And the problem here is that you've got two categories of Vedic literature that deal with the, these astronomical cosmological issues. One is the Puranas, like the Bhagavad Purana, which describe our world, our earth, as we call it, as part of a plane that uh, exists in the form of a series of ring islands and oceans. It's like another type of geography, you know, like, like in the uh, Lord of the Rings, you know, they came up with a, a different geography than mm -hmm. the one that we're familiar with. So that's the problem with, it's not a problem, it's just the fact that that, that world of ring islands and oceans is not something that we directly observed today you know at the very center of it there's a golden mountain you know that's hundred thousand miles high and thirty thousand miles wide and we we just don't see it with our present senses now another kind of vedic literature called the jyoti shastras uh, they're used by astrologers to calculate positions they describe the earth as a globe, more or less the same size as the earth as described by modern astronomers. Mm. So, uh, so there's this contradiction between what we see and what we can't see at the present moment. So, uh, if you get into these things, that's what you wind up with. So one has to explain, I would say if one is a flat earth uh, advocate and you're also trying to keep things in harmony with the Srimad Bhagavatam and the Jyoti Shastras, you run into some problems. Like the, uh, I don't know if this is just getting too much into the weeds for, for people, but since you brought it up, uh, according to the Bhagavatam view, the sun is going around on a mountain that's just a little bit above the horizon. Hmm. So if you think today is a flat earth, and you're trying to harmonize it with the Srimad Bhagavatam, you would have to explain why we don't see the sun going around parallel to the horizon, just a little bit above the horizon. You know, like, like you would see if you were in the Arctic Circle within the Arctic Circle in the North Polar Regions or the South Polar Regions mm. during, say, in the, in the North, mm. in the Polar Regions during the summer. That's what you'd see. You'd see the sun just going around the horizon, not going beneath the horizon. So I would say, hey, I live in LA. In the summertime, midsummer, I go to the beach, I look west, I would see the sun coming up in the east at noon be practically over my head. And then 
and, and, and in the evening it goes straight down into the into the ocean. <clears throat> it, it really doesn't <laughs> doesn't correspond to like a flat Earth with the Srimad Bhagavatam there. So, anyways, if somebody wants to get into these things, that's the sort of issues that you have to deal sure. with. You know, so now with your writings and your research regarding the theory of evolution, you were presenting that um, one can look at the current evidence and it lines up with what we'll find in Mahabharata, what we'll find in Srimad Bhagavatam and Ramayana, and et cetera, that there have, that, that there have been intelligent, um, well-developed, you know, beings um, on earth going way, 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 way back. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go to those same literatures, we'll find that they're also saying that beings like this have existed not only on the earth, but on innumerable planets throughout the universe, um, which brings us to the topics of, you know, life on other planets. And so this is also a subject that you speak on often, I believe, correct? I touch on it sometimes. I appeared several times in several episodes in a series that aired on uh, cable channel, history channel. Ancient oh, aliens. Ancient aliens. We are well aware of your fame from <laughs> ancient aliens. But Kostuba, yes. Kostuba will always persist with these alien questions. I want to take it a little bit more <laughs> from theology. Can you hold off? He likes the he likes these crazy things. I want to. Well, I'm just looking at the clock. We got 20 minutes for aliens. I did this for you. <laughs> okay, well, I, I want to know if there's they speak about. Um, someone wrote a question. Jason wrote, Jason Stitz wrote this question. Uh, is there massive underground world in the middle of the earth? What about the cent? They speak about subterranean existence. Is that in the earth, or is that like at another level below the earth when they talk about subterranean worlds? It depends on whether you're looking at the Puranic view or the Jyotish view. So, but the so these two views coexist, meaning they're not like there. There's something that there are two different vantage points of this of the same thing. They they they're both can be real. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's one solution. You, you know, you you get into having to offer interpretations. I mean, both of these Shastras are there, the Jyotish and the Puranic. And one solution is to say, it's a matter of perception, that if you've got senses that are limited, like to our human limits of our senses, things appear to the senses as they're described in the Jyoti Shastras. And the uh, Puranas are giving a view as things appear to the senses of higher beings. You know, that, that's, that's kind of the solution that at the present moment I, I prefer. Hmm. But like according to the Quranic view, you've got this plane of Blue Mandala, and below it, within the universe, are these lower planetary systems. According, now, when you translate that into the Jyoti Shastras, they say those lower planetary systems are within the Earth globe. So, within yeah, the Earth globe, inside of it, inside of it, oh not. My God. Not below it, but inside of it. So, wow. Uh, it's it's these are different ways of looking at things, but you know, even in modern science, you've got things like this. Say, if an astronomer is looking at a certain part of the sky at night through an optical telescope, he may see lots of stars in some areas and some areas look like they're completely black you know devoid of any stars or galaxies 
And then an astronomer using an X-ray telescope will see a massive source of X-rays in an area where the optical astronomer sees nothing. Hmm. So uh, how to explain it? Yeah, the, 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 the uh, X-ray telescope astronomer may say, hey, look at that. There's a, a, an amazing object there. And the astronomer using the optical telescope will say, I don't see anything there. And the other astronomer will say, well, of course, you're not using the right instrument. You have to look through the uh, X-ray telescope. And the guy using the optical astronomer will say, no, no, if it doesn't show up in my optical telescope, it doesn't exist. Sure. Or to put it in Bakke terms, you can go to a place like Vrindavan and I might just see some muddy streets with some hogs and camels. And whereas someone, an elevated soul uh, like Rupa Goswami may be seeing something entirely different, maybe seeing Krishna, Radha, the gopis, and the palaces of Nanda Maharaj, and everything like that. So Sure, there's different goggles we wear. Yeah. There's different uh, to to view the world, and depending on the goggles we're wearing, we're seeing we're seeing the same thing, but seeing it in different ways. Yeah. Um, Kostuba, how did you want to get into our UFO questions then? You, you started with this idea, like we, there have been evolved beings. We speak we speak on a regular basis of evolved beings, and we speak of them having their own planets or on their own planets. So the idea, it's, it seems almost sim simplistic that, actually, I like, I, I, I like the whole concept of ancient aliens because um, the idea is that alien just means they're just visiting, they're just visiting. They're going on tour, on vacation to other planets. And isn't that all an alien is? The, I think, go ahead. How about if we, if we approach it this way? Um, currently in the past century, I suppose, there's so much, there has been so much said and so much written and, and discussed um, regarding the idea of life on other planets or even that life visiting the earth. Um, and I believe even like perhaps the, you know, the most recent um, kind of big deal was that within the past week or so, I believe that a, a very high level Israeli official began to talk about this in great detail and that it's been suppressed by the government and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in any case, there's always been so much talk and, and um, it's so many testimonies to um, perceiving, you know, life from other planets. Now, when we look at Mahabharata and we look at Ramayana and we look at Srimad Bhagavatam, it's saying that there has always been life on other planets. Um, is there any correlation um, if I'm a person that is developing some faith in, say, Srimad Bhagavatam, is there anything there in the, you know, current um, uh, field of, I don't know, what would you call the field, the field of alien life or something like that, that would correspond in some way or be relevant to my developing faith? Uh... Well, sometimes if we're entertained by something that's interesting for us, it, it, and we see something that corresponds with reality and can be verified in some way, it kind of helps us. I mean, everything I do is part of my practice of bhakti yoga, you know, like studying the relationship between science and you know, today's scientific ideas and what's in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's all part of my practice of bhakti yoga. But uh, um, specifically, you know, you can find accounts in the Srimad Bhagavatam and other Vedic literatures about vimanas, you know, spacecraft, used to travel from planet to planet or region to region of the universe. You can find uh, accounts of uh, robotic technology. You can find, you can find accounts of all kinds of things that 
have only recently come to be a topic for modern scientists. So I think that's very interesting. It's you know kind of fascinating, and it it offers um, uh, a point of entry for people who today are interested in such things. So yeah, I, I think it's useful. It can increase you know some person's faith. It's not absolutely uh -huh. necessary are, to get into uh, it. But. Sure, but are there testimonies that we hear? um consistently that correlate with things that we find in in these ancient texts well like i like some of the descriptions of the vimanas like there was a description of one that was used by king shalva who was a kind of an asura you know, a kind of an ungodly type of person, a materialist, atheist type of person that existed at that time. On the earth, right? He was like a, living on earth. He was living on earth. He had some and kind like, of far out spaceship. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, he used it to attack the city of Dwarka, which was Krishna's city. And what I you know, found interesting about it is that the way that this craft, is described, it resembles many of the modern UFO observations that have been made by people such as military pilots and airline pilots and things like that. When he attacked this city, he was, it's, first of all, it's described in the Bhagavatam that this craft was made of metal. You know, so it was some kind of technology. Actually, it was designed and built by Maya Donova, who was the engineer of the Asuras. And he, he was an extraterrestrial being. So you could say it's an example of extraterrestrial technology transfer. <laughs> so King Shalva was, was, he had his soldiers, his people, in this Vimana, which was actually a huge thing. It was not like a small thing, it was a huge thing. It's almost like a town in itself or something like that. Yeah, yeah they were kind of raining down weapons on uh, the city of Dwarka. And uh, Krishna's soldiers that were part of his army were trying to shoot it down. But they found it very difficult because according to the description, it would appear in multiple forms. So you couldn't tell which one was the actual ship. Yeah, you didn't know if you were shooting down a, a, a you know, projected image of it or the real thing. And it's kind of like it parallels some modern military technologies. You know, they have warheads that they put on intercontinental ballistic missiles. And what they will do is when the warhead is coming towards the country that they're trying, that they're thinking they're going to attack, it will display false images, you know, to the radar of the mm. defending country so that they can't really tell what's the real warhead. Uh, it's kind of interesting. It's also described that uh, the ship. The, had the ability to disappear and appear at different places. And again, this is like modern military technology, like stealth aircraft and things mm -hmm. like that. that can what's disappear. To yeah, what to speak of uh, these um, people who have actually seen UFOs, these testimonies. I just watched that movie Phenomenon yesterday, and it's really just a bunch of testimonies. And then... At the, you know, at the 11th hour, when something's come out, they switch it up and they say, uh, oh, it never happened. It never happened. It was a weather balloon. Um, what to speak of the people who they say, no, 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 it was here. And then it was just not here. And then it was here and it just shot up. You, how fast did it go? It went as fast as a gunshot. That's how fast it went. You know, that's how people would describe these things. So those, <coughs> the way, <coughs> excuse me, the way you describe <coughs> Shala's ship of appearing and disappearing, that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, another thing that's described is that it would move kind of like a butterfly. You know, it would make 
maneuvers that are really impossible to make. I remember once I was giving a lecture in Germany and a pilot for one of the uh, big American airlines, you know, came to the lecture and you know, he told me about an experience that he had. He was flying across the Atlantic and he saw a UFO, some kind of craft coming straight towards him at a very high rate of speed, you know, and, and it came right close to him, you know, like he's flying this way, this thing is flying like that. And he said, wow. when it came really close to us, it just went straight up. You know, he said, you, there's nothing that we have that can maneuver like that, like just go. Well, um, and he said, said well. we don't report these things. We're supposed to, but we don't because it gets us in a lot of trouble with uh, the government. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, in that movie Phenomenon, which I, 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 I mean, it was a little, it was a little boring, but it had a lot of bunch of straight up statistics about uh, and stories about people, very qualified people like lieutenants, majors, high ups in military, who I think the original one, Area Fifty One, was found. It was found by a, like a, a leader, uh, one of, one of the brass in the Air Force, and um, he saw it. He saw exactly what it was. He went to identify it. Then other people came and said, okay, here's what you did see. You saw a weather balloon made of uh, whatever weather balloons are made of. And here's some pictures of weather balloons, and this is what we're going to present it. And I think he's giving his very mature statement now. He, gives, he, he tells it frankly what happened in the, in the movie. But he said, yeah, and they just told me I, I couldn't talk about it. So there's probably a point, and maybe for, I'm, I'm, I'm not even saying for diabolical reasons, but there's a reason why it's not maybe good for everybody to know about these things. Yeah. What do you think? I think you're right about that. And I'll add one more thing about the uh, Shalva, Shalva Bimana. That Shalva beamed himself down. He got out of the Bimana, which is floating in the air, and because he wanted to personally attack Krishna. Mm. So he he does that. He attacks Krishna. They fight. Um, and, well, they fight with spears and, and arrows. But the way that they're described is not like some stick with a little point on it. You know, it says they roared across the sky like lightning bolts, and you know, it sounds like some other type of weapon. But in the course of the battle, a messenger appears and tells Krishna, mm. Shalva has captured your father. And then Shalva is, Krishna looks, and Shalva is there, and he's got his father, Vasudev, and he cuts his head off with a sword. And then holding the head and leaving the body on the ground, he elevates back up into the Vimana. And then the Vimana kind of takes, takes off. And then Krishna looked very carefully and he saw the messenger disappeared and his body on the ground, his father's body on the ground just disappeared. And then he understood it was an illusion. It was like a 3D holographic image, you know, produced by the technology of Maya Donova and that Vimana. Uh, so I, I, to me, that's very interesting stuff. I mean, he recreated his, he recreated Krishna's father, and he pretended like he had him by the hair and went to cut off his head. What a like a what a like a ingenious, evil wizard. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just amazing. I, I, I'm surprised nobody's made a movie of this. This is just like... Okay. Um, anyway, it's almost time to go, but I really wanted to ask one more question about Nagas. Can you say anything about Nagas? Nagas are serpent-like beings. Um, they are said to inhabit one of the lower planetary systems. And... They, they're usually depicted in the Indian art and sculpture with a, a serpent body 
and the, kind of like the torso and head and arms, human-like. And apparently they had uh, shape-shifting abilities also. So you find them in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata. Are they similar to dragons? Like, like how Chinese worship dragons and, um, uh, or Loch Ness or things like that? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But they, they, they generally, as I said, you know, like they had mystical powers, shape-shifting abilities. You, you hear sometimes in circles, alternative circles, the idea of shape-shifting reptilians. We could, we could spend another hour on reptilian people. But it is time to go. And I want to thank our special guest, Michael Cremo, Drew to Karma Prabhu. Thank you. I want to appreciate your great contribution of paradigm shifting for the world and just walking into these scientific conference and saying, you know, there's other ways to look at the world. And it's quite beautiful. And it helps us with our faith and our understanding of these sort of almost otherworldly things. Thank you so much for all that you do and all that you've done. And thank you for joining us here. People have been commenting. I wish the show could go on for four more hours. We're going to have to get you back. Would, would that be okay? I would love to come back. <laughs> Thanks, Prabhu. Thanks for all our guests who join us on Facebook. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can join us here um, on Zoom every day. You just have to email Mara at wisdomofthesages108 at gmail.com. Wisdomofthesages108 at gmail.com. We do this every morning, Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. And uh, Eastern Time. That's 5 a.m. Eastern Time. Or listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. And everybody can go to Apple Podcasts right now, write us a good review, and tell us your story, how you got on your spiritual path. We'd love to hear it. Till tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> it's Kirtan time. <laughs> <laughs>